thank you, everybody. And so for our last psych talk, we're lucky to have Dr. Tasha Howe. She's the department chair for psychology here at Humboldt, and she's been incredibly helpful and supportive of our club and this series. And so we're happy to have her close us out. And so a bit of her background, she got her PhD from UC Riverside in developmental psychology. And then she did a postdoc at Vanderbilt where she focused on developmental psychopathology. And she's been at HSU since 20, or 2002, where she teaches classes in developmental and family relations, which is what a large portion of her research and teaching focuses on. She even wrote one of the books for the classes, Marriages and Families of the 21st Century, a Bioecological Approach. And then apart from her teaching here at Humboldt, she's also been a Fulbright Scholar in Croatia in the Iowa Nation of Cyprus which we'll hear more about. And then, yeah, and then other than that, she's done some publications in development in psychopathology and self and identity, where she actually won an award for best paper of the year in 2015. And so we're lucky to hear about her research today on child welfare practices and her international work. So help me welcome her to the stage. <laughs> gorgeous sunny day and sitting here in the dark with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to take you on a little journey around the world. The first half is going to be more thought-provoking stuff to think about if you want to travel internationally, if you want to work with people from diverse cultures, and then the second half will be more of the slideshow of several of the countries that I've worked in. Um, so anytime Fulbright pays for you to live in foreign countries, you sign a contract that says you'll put Fulbright on every presentation <laughs> having to do with it. So if you want to know more about the Fulbright, we can talk about that in the Q&A. If you want to travel internationally, I highly recommend doing U.S. State Department funded programs. They pay for everything and really support you, and it's an amazing, amazing experience. I've done three Fulbrights now, and they have all kinds of student programs from the U.S. State Department. So this is a famous quote that I wanted to start with because a lot of people have heard this quote before and I think it's in general pretty <coughs> accurate. So Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one's little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. So it's a common refrain that travel reduces racism. And I think that's true if you travel in the proper way. There are many different ways to travel. For example, Americans tend to travel where they don't encounter people from both cultures and countries. So for example, Jamaica a great destination that many Americans go to, and almost all of them stay in walled-in resorts where they never actually meet any Jamaican people. And then they come back and they say, Jamaica is awesome, so beautiful, I love Jamaica. But they don't actually understand Jamaica, except for this very narrow view. So it's not that all travel reduces racism and bigotry, but if you travel in a more open manner and keep some of the things in mind that I am going to be talking about today, I think travel is one of the best ways to increase world peace and prevent violence around the world. Because many people around the world, including here, are in their little corner of the universe and never come out of that. So they only view the world from that tiny, tiny little perspective. So in terms of my work in child welfare, one of my favorite quotes is by an Indian British scholar. And Maitra says, we must recognize cultural bias masquerading as expertise. So this is something that if you're going to be in psychology or any other discipline traveling around the world, when we come from developed industrialized nations, we tend to think we have the science, we have the answers, we have the backing, we know what these other countries should do. We can give them our expertise and our advice. But one thing we often don't think about is that many times what we think are facts really are just assumptions. They're things that we haven't actually tested. 
They're things that we just assume because of our worldview from growing up in a developed Western industrialized nation. If you did not grow up in a Western industrialized nation, you already have an advantage because you already know that you can look at this type of culture that's typically the people serving as experts, you can look at them with a little bit more nuance, with a little bit more depth than we tend to look at ourselves. And so um, one of the things about my career is that I kind of straddle the worlds between psychology and social work. Most of the work I do is very relevant to social workers. And in fact, most of the people I interact with around the world in my trainings are social workers of some kind. And so I've published in social work journals and I was interested in, you know, how do we globalize social welfare work? And I looked at the accreditation standards of the Council of Social Work Education and they actually do require for your program to be accredited globalized thinking and self-reflection. But then when you look at how many social work programs in the country actually place students in international placements, only 21% of them place students internationally, and most of those placements are in Canada. So if you want to experience another culture, probably going to Canada is not gonna give you a ton of insights, because they are a very similar culture to us. And I'll <coughs> add a little parenthetical statement here that in the Fulbright, it's no different with us PhDs. The most competitive Fulbrights for American scholars are Canada, England, and Australia, and New Zealand. Why? We want to go experience other cultures. We want international connectedness. We want to build world peace, but not if it takes us out of our comfort zone of our little tiny corner. And so if you're wanting to go where there's a lot of white people speaking English, and that's the same group you grew up with, then it's going to probably be a little bit less enlightening than it might otherwise be. If you already grew up in a non-industrialized or non-white English speaking culture, you already have an advantage for expanding to other world travel because you already can see the world from at least two points of view, from two cultural perspectives, maybe from two linguistic perspectives. So you already have a little bit of an advantage. So when they do surveys of these social work students and they're trying to figure out if they want to place them internationally and they read their essays, they find a lot of common statements in the essays which are somewhat paternalistic in nature. The most common statement is I want to help those poor people. So I want to help those people. I want to be of service to the less fortunate. Um, I've always been fascinated by people from that group. Jamaicans are so interesting. I just really think they're fascinating. Or I met a Jamaican and they were really nice. And so they tend to have a lot of these statements in their essays, I want to ensure they have a better life. Um, a lot of kids or students talk about posting things on social media to set a good example for other students coming behind them. So it's not that these statements or ideas are inherently bad, it's just that you have to think about what your mindset is and whether it's an impediment to your goals in that country or whether it's gonna facilitate you meeting your goals in that country. So it's just to think about what is your true reason for doing what you're doing. Is it to post Instagram photos of you with people from another culture? is that going to help you accomplish what is your true desire when you're going to that country? So just something to think about. So when I got into this field, I was thinking about, I've been working in child maltreatment in the US for my whole career, and I feel like I need to understand the global issues. Those of you who have taken class with me know I use a bioecological perspective. So I need to understand the cultural ramifications for child abuse and neglect. I need to understand how cultural, structural, and systemic changes and forces affect child maltreatment. And so if you look at the statistics around the world, it's one billion kids last year who were documented to experience some form of child abuse and neglect. It's extremely common. And even if you don't care about kids, you should care about money. And this is what I talk to politicians about. Even if you don't care at all about kids and families, 
you should care about money. And that's what I hope at some point our immigration debate right now is gonna talk about the dollars and cents because obviously um, appealing to someone's humanity is not working in the current administration. So every dollar that you put into preventing child abuse and neglect, you save seven to nine dollars that are currently being spent on mental health services, incarceration, um, substance abuse treatment, all kinds of costs that we incur from child abuse and neglect down the road. So it really is cost effective to try to prevent child abuse and neglect. And the United Nations has come together with a statement for their sustainable development goals that by the year 2030, they really want to stop abuse and neglect. And it sounds crazy, like that'll never happen. But their last sustainable development goals or millennium development goals involved reducing extreme poverty in the world and they actually did it. There are millions and millions fewer kids living in extreme poverty and starving than there were 10 years ago. So these countries coming together in the United Nations goals for humanity actually do make an impact in things like HIV, AIDS, clean water, sustainable living and so forth. So we need to understand what is the global impact on things, even if we're just gonna stay in our own country and do it, what are the systemic and social and macro cultural issues? So depending on the study that you look at, there's between 20 and 65% of kids that have been abused are neglected and millions of kids are documented to have been sexually abused and that doesn't even count the millions who haven't been reported to have been sexually abused. 50,000 kids each year documented to have died from homicide. So that includes death at the hands of their caregivers and parents. And many of these cases are not even solved, so the numbers are actually higher. So knowing all these statistics and how terrible it is and what I've done in my training in the US, I came to over my five years of PhD, two years of postdoc and all the other years of teaching to my guiding principles which are really illustrating that although there are cultural differences that we need to understand around the world, there's actually a lot of similarities of humanity that can help us solve a lot of social problems. People in the hallway come in, there's plenty of chairs, there's chairs up here, you don't need to stand out there. So my guiding principles are, one, child abuse and neglect can be prevented. We have clear evidence in many cultures that it can be prevented. And it doesn't matter what culture you live in, what your cultural or religious beliefs are. So we use the universal human development principles of attachment theory and how do adults learn and process information. So when we're working with parents, policymakers, counselors, social workers, we have to know how adults learn in order to change some of the behaviors that we want to change. So these are pretty simple guiding principles and this is really what drives me on and what has led to so many successful things um, in the different countries that I've been in. So what is my advice to you? Before you go anywhere, first study the culture and the history. Make sure you know what's going on there and not just a media representation of what's going on there. Read what you can in actual books not just on the internet, but understand the culture and the history. And after you do that, consider whether, quote, cultural trends are actually due to culture. Because culture is often confounded with many other variables, such as socioeconomic status, racism, discrimination, or you're looking at a small segment of the population and you're saying this is how, quote, that culture is. Or it's some geographical or environmental challenge that is leading to that behavior or those traits or those beliefs or those tendencies. So is it really culture? For example, if someone from Mars came down and said, I want to know what American college culture is like, I'm going to go down to the plaza in Arcata and then they go back to their planet and they tell them what US American college culture is. That's pretty much what we do when we travel the world. We go to the Arcata Plaza in another country 
and we meet those four people down there smoking pot, and then we decide what American college culture is or whatever culture is. So we have to really try to figure out, is what we're seeing really culture, or is there other, are there other factors contributing to these things? So I'll give you an example of when I lived in Croatia on one of my Fulbrights. So I lived in Croatia for a couple months, and I'm taking the tram, and I'm going downtown and doing my thing, and I realized that no one ever looks at me. <laughs> no one ever says hi. No one ever opens the door. And here in Northern California, we're used to like, hey, how's it going? You wave, you smile. It's very, very friendly in general. And so once I got to know people, I wanted to know like, what's going on with this? Is this a deliberate thing? Is this unconscious? What does it mean? What's the thing going on with this huge difference in how we might interact with strangers? And so they told me that during the war, which was in the 90s, the 1990s, not the 1890s, during the war, because the partisans were coming and kidnapping people, and many people were being sent to concentration camps, people learned to go to work, go to school, get on the tram, go on the bus, never make eye contact with anyone, because anyone could be an infiltrator or an informer, and everyone in your neighborhood could be informing on you and making you be taken away from your family, if not killed. So everyone developed the tendency to just look down, get in the tram, go where you're going, go to school, don't look up. And so that's an artifact of a country and a culture in Croatia that's still traumatized because of this war that they went through. And so I'm there as a Fulbright scholar trying to work in child abuse prevention, and I need to know what is happening with the adults because they're the ones raising the kids. So I need to know how the war trauma is still affecting these people. If I were a tourist, I could come away and go, you know what, Croatians are cold, man. They are not friendly at all. They never even smile at you when you come into a store. And I really think that Croatian culture is kind of standoffish. So that's the tourist view versus really trying to understand what could have been some of these other factors that led to some of these things. Um, one of the women I met <laughs> showed me the contents of her purse to this day. She still has first aid kits, like a whistle, like all kinds of stuff in her purse that she started carrying during the war. And she's like, I know the war is over, but I still carry this. Like, I want to be prepared for anything that happens. You know, she's got like bandages and stuff in there, bombs dropped on the hospital near her house and things like that. Um, so just think about when you're visiting other cultures, is culture actually out there or is culture in here? It's probably a bi-directional relationship between the two but really how much of it is a manifestation of their historic experiences and things about them as a people that they're trying to preserve that's a legacy of their humanity, their rituals, their history as a people, and how much of it is sort of imposed upon them by the forces of things that happened to them before. So a few questions to ask yourself before you go. Is this trend, this behavior, this idea that you've heard about, that you've read about, actually due to their culture, or is it due to a biased perspective that's been writing about them, or you've seen videos on YouTube about them? Really think about what has the U.S. done to them in the past, because this is probably, I can't even think of a country I've been to where the U.S. hasn't done something to them. The U.S. has done something to pretty much everyone in the past. So what do we have to do with their current situation and how do they see us? So when I'm talking to the Croatians about this whole cultural difference, they were telling me we hate that about Americans, that we think you guys are fake. We think that you could not possibly be that happy all the time. Why do you just go, hey, how's it going? Why are you so happy all the time? Like they, they find that that's artificial. And I said, actually, it's not artificial in most cases. Most of the time, we're just like, hey, how's it going? Hi, you make eye contact, and it's really not fake. I can't say nobody's fake, but in general, we're genuinely friendly and happy. And when I was living in Cyprus, I had a similar conversation with a Greek journalist who said, you know why? Because you have the look of freedom on your face. <laughs> and so I thought that was really interesting, that we have the look of freedom on our face, and that's why it's so easy to smile and be so happy all the time. 
because we have not had the war on our shores before. So one of the ways that I think about going to work in other cultures is I love this idea of a reverse mission ideology, because you know the old mission ideology is what got us where we are now, where Western industrialized nations went around the world, colonized people, killed them, tried to destroy their culture, wouldn't let them speak their language, and they wanted to turn them into them. So I want you to forget everything you've ever known and become me. That's a missionary zeal trying to convert people into you. So the reverse mission ideology is actually the opposite of that. And I really like this idea where you take a horizontal approach to your work in other countries. So you're not an expert coming in telling them what's what. They're your partner, and they're telling you what their needs are, and you're trying to facilitate them in meeting their own goals, and you guys are a team. You're never above as the Western expert coming in. And even if you're not from the US, a lot of our students are not from the US, and then they go back to their home country after they graduate, and you're already seen as part of the cognitive elite. You're no longer part of your group that you grew up with because you're part of this Western ivory tower. So you're already separated from them. And even when in that sort of situation, you have to be careful about not coming in as knowing more than everyone. Um, and I'm sure your families have told you, you know, you think you know everything. You went to that fancy school. So when we come to these other countries, think of ourselves as the students. We are the students. We are here to learn. The context is our teacher. And we're going to do twice as much listening as we do talking. So I tend to not talk very much unless people are asking me my opinion. I'm not offering my opinion about things. And so one of the things that is the crux of this kind of tweaked mindset or this reframe is that you reflect on yourself changing. How am I going to go to this place and how am I going to change? What's going to happen to me? Not what huge impact am I going to have on them, not how am I going to change the world and help these poor people, but how am I going to change to be a better facilitator for the professional goals that I have in mind? How is this going to make me stronger and a better ambassador for whatever social welfare programs I'm doing? And so this is a reframe of things. Um, and so you kind of set reasonable goals for impact. And for me, a lot of times my reasonable goal is I'm going to go to this country and I'm going to have some in-depth conversations with these people. And that's my goal. That's it. <laughs> you can't expect more because your ideas might actually not work in that context. So I'm going to, at most, learn a lot from these conversations and maybe they will too. Call it a day. So it's a really a modest goal, even though we all want to save the world and we've got our college education and we're super excited to go and you know be a superhero. It's really a slow, painful, glacially paced process of change that you're going to experience in the real world of social change coming to institutions, agencies, cities, or countries. So this is the basic framework that I have that I'm hoping that people will go into the world with. And I'll give you a few examples of child welfare work specifically before I get into the slideshow of our little journey around the world. So one of the things in child welfare that we kind of think is necessary is mandated reporting. So in the US especially, and in most Western countries, we believe that if you work around children, you should be required to call the authorities and report all child abuse and neglect. The authorities should come and investigate. The authorities should come and place that child in a safe environment and probably a foster home or somewhere like that. So mandated reporting is just part of our child welfare culture, but we have never actually evaluated the effectiveness of mandated reporting. It's an assumption that we disguise as expertise. When we go to other countries, we try to implement mandated reporting. But what we have around the world are many examples of kinship care that reduces child abuse and neglect. There are actual program evaluations of many cultures that use the elders in the culture, whether it's imams at the mosque, elders in the community, community leaders, tribal leaders, as the liaison, and they use their 
ideologies, their reputation as a family, and their community support to do what needs to be done to protect that child and to reduce abuse and neglect and to work with the parents on changing their ways so that they improve their image in the eyes of the community. So you don't actually have to have mandated reporting with officials coming in and taking kids away. You don't have to have that. But whatever you do, we do have to evaluate it to make sure that it actually reduces child abuse and neglect or whatever your goal is for whatever type of work you're doing. A couple of other ideas I run into in a lot of different countries is that in the West, we think that ideas of mine can change with effort. You have anxiety, with effort you can reduce it. You have problems with your spouse, with effort you can change it. And a lot of other cultures believe in fatalism, that bad things that are happening to you are God's will, or it's just the way of the fates, it's my destiny. And so you don't actually have to change their fatalistic viewpoints when they say the child was abused, it's God's will. You don't actually have to change their essential beliefs to reduce violence against children. So this is one of my main points, is that we don't have to colonize people or have colonial practices or change their essential ideologies to still get the objective met that we want to get. Another example is male dominance. Of course, in the West, we like egalitarianism. We would love it if there wasn't a patriarchy. Destroy the patriarchy. And the patriarchy is strong around the world. But could you stop violence against women and children if you maintain the patriarchy in some cultures? The answer is yes. And there are program evaluations to show that you can, for example, capitalize on the positive aspects of machismo and family relations for leading men to stop abusing their wives, for example. So we can work within the cultural constraints and not have to impose our ideas on people. Another example is self-actualization. In the West, we really want people to reach their highest goals and you know, live a life of the mind and be self-actualized, but most people are just focused on survival. So if I'm just focused on survival, how am I gonna stop beating my kids? I gotta go to work, you know? <laughs> what are you gonna do to help me in this situation? Likewise, we believe that kids should have an autonomy, an identity that's separate from us and that they should question us and you know, it's a democratic way of parenting. But many cultures believe in obedience to elders and deference. Do we have to change that fundamental belief to stop them from beating or neglecting their kids? We actually don't. And so another thing that we have in the US is the idea that foster care is better than institutional care. And we learn from our own history that kids living in orphanages is pretty terrible and living with alternative families is better. But what we find around the world is that many cultures have institutional care that is actually based in attachment theory and actually is doing pretty good for kids. And they don't have any foster parents. They don't have an adoption system. For example, when I was in Russia, they don't have a foster care system. They have an orphanage and the moms are in there with the kids. So the moms have a drug problem. They bring them in there with the kids and then they work on substance abuse treatment, psychotherapy, job training the kids in there with the mom. They work on the attachment relationship. Some kids are there without any parents and they're working on a holistic care system. They make the moms go swimming every day and go to the gym and exercise every day. So they don't really know about attachment theory, but a lot of what they're doing is attachment based and it's really supporting that mom to recover with her child and be able to live on her own again. So just because we think foster care is the gold standard, it doesn't mean it's the only way you can do things and it doesn't mean that institutional or group-based care is necessarily bad. So I'm gonna stop here and see if anyone has any questions about anything that I've said so far before we go on our little slideshow journey. What's on your mind? Comments, questions, yes. So <clears throat> I do agree with you that uh, people going out of their country to go help other cultures and societies, they do have a very like Western sense or different points of view. But I feel like it's a key to your study would be the incorporation of people of color, like usually people who can go out and travel and help are white, affluent um, people. And people of color, we have, we're being attacked within this own country. So to say that like, oh yeah, go out, help other cultures be better off without <laughs> taking care of what is going on here first, it kind of like, I don't know, 
what what specific comment are you making about the reframe that I'm asking people to do? I'm only asking people to do this if they want to go work abroad. I'm not saying everyone should work abroad. I'm right. saying if you want to work abroad, you should really think about a lot of these different ideas that people often have when they travel abroad. But I'm not saying you have to work abroad. Mm -hmm. So all the work that I do internationally, I also do here. So I'm not sure if that's what you're addressing or that um, mostly white people have the privilege of traveling abroad. As opposed to not, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, and that's changing. So we're definitely seeing more kids, students being able to travel and the State Department programs <coughs> have specific programs for students of color. So there are more opportunities now for people to get government support to travel. Yeah. When you refer to uh, healthcare as a gold staple and dealing with children usually alone, um, was that just was that your personal view, or was that a view that other countries have upon? That's the view that the U.S. and most Western cultures have. That is what we believe is the best thing to do with kids, and what all of our child welfare policy is about okay. is that we have the concurrent planning. You get 18 months in foster care, your parents' rights are terminated, and we always want to find permanency with foster families. So we just, because of our history with horrible orphanages and group homes, we evolved out of that into a new model, but we didn't actually think about you could transform the other model as well. And you don't have to have completely no institutional or group care. You could have group care that's much more communally based with gardens, and projects and things that bring all the residents together, that's a totally different model. Well, that's still in good care. There are still group homes in some areas. Right, but the group homes that we have here are based on the old model, which is like institutionalized care with a clinician. Kids are locked in. Kids are on a ton of medication. So it's really not a wraparound attachment-based system in the few group homes that we do have left. And unfortunately, the group homes are typically reserved for kids of color over the age of 10. So we're seeing that the white kids are being shuffled more into the private homes and the kids of color are going more into the institutional care and medicalized. So we have a very racist system in this country where the group homes are often really just tiny jails. And so that's really, we haven't really, I kind of thought about a way to reconceptualize what the institutional care could be, that it could be something different between foster care and the old terrible ways. Yeah, I, I just I would <clears throat> want to consider it to be a golden staple at all because there's so much failing in other areas. Yes, the system is fatally flawed, but it is the system that our country advocates as the best way to do things. Even with even with all the problems. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, I'm really interested in that idea of like uh, fatalism. What would be an example of how we can um, like help the uh, child of youth in the West in those types of like mindsets? Well, I can't do it because I don't have fatalistic beliefs. And so I have to have my horizontal partners think about that in the context of their group. And so they have said to me a few ideas that they have done with their parents that they work with is that they have convinced a lot of neglecting parents that you are actually interfering with your child's destiny because the destiny should have unfolded and they cite scriptures of their religion your, de your child's destiny is much more full of love and the universe is supporting this child and you're actually interfering with that. And so this isn't something that I can do as the white lady coming in, you know, but this is something that my horizontal partners think about ways because they're all from the cultures and the groups that I work with. And so this is for them to figure out. Um, but they really do believe that children should not be subject to abuse. I appreciate the discussion that is happening right now because um, I think it's important to acknowledge that you know we are this nation that has a lot of problems and oppression um, within our systems, and so going to other countries, it's easy to assume that maybe those systems that are here that aren't working for us to the degree we would like them to be um, are 
also being implemented into other countries. And so it's like, you can go there and it's like a positive experience and you come out of a Fulbright scholar, um, but then like you don't really go, like you can't really like go back like every like four years or five years right. or whatever to, to go check up on how it is and how your impact was or, or something. And that's what I make sure that I do. I'm still in contact with all of my horizontal partners in every country and I'm still doing consultations with them all. That's amazing of you. And, and I, I don't charge any money for any of my services in developing countries, so I do it all for free. That's awesome. Um, Fulbright pays for my travel, though. Do you, um, <laughs> do you know if you have to be a citizen of the United States of America to do a Fulbright? To do a Fulbright. Any State Department thing, you have to be a citizen, yes. Okay. And so that's, you know, something that's beyond the scope of this talk, but we won't go down that journey right now. Any other last thoughts before we go CFE country? Yes. I've been wanting to travel to do like academic, academic research and things like that, mm -hmm. but I can't get over the whole like, uh, like guilt of feeling like a settler type of, yeah. you know, like I it's just, a struggle. How did you get over that? I'm never over it. It's a constant struggle. I am aware of my privilege every second of every day and it's really hard. And I, I, it's, I don't think it's ever gonna end. You know, I mean, it helps that I grew up in poverty and that I had a really horrific childhood in the ghetto in LA. Maybe that helps me a little bit, but what you see now is this educated, proper speaking white lady, you know, from the university. And so it's really, really hard, even as a person of color, like I said, you're now in the cognitive elite. You've got the college degree, you're no longer going to be the same that your family thought you were before or your community thought you were before. And it's just a struggle that you just have to be aware of the privileges you have and try to pay those privileges forward to help other people to realize that they actually have the power to transform their own community. They don't need you to come in and do it, but they just need that horizontal partner to get the wheels turning so that they can be like, yeah, we're doing it, you know, power to the people. And so that's where we come in, is that we do have the formal education to be a partner in their journey of their own community transformation. But it's, it's a struggle, yeah. I, I did have, have a question about, um, you said other cultures tend to have practices that are more effective at, at Sometimes. Sometimes. But most practices in any country are never evaluated. <coughs> but we can't assume that their practices are not effective which is what we often do because we think we've got the research, so try what we do and it's going to make your life better. But I, I mean, the difference between this country and a lot of countries is the homogenous culture of other, other countries because that's what we do now. We have mm -hmm. great diversity and I understand when you say gold standard, you don't mean it's the best idea. It's just no, what we it's do. what the U.S. Right? thinks is that's the right That's the gold standard of right. yeah. business as usual. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering, do you think some, and and I, strangely, I like the idea of what Lesha was doing about bringing in mothers because, mm -hmm. yeah, you're probably better off with your mom and getting both everybody put together uh, and then, then the horrible system we have here. So do you think that some of those, I mean, do you have faith in those translating here? I mean, I, I We do have some family-oriented substance abuse treatment programs, and they ha do have effectiveness. So, but they're pockets. They're not like a cultural viewpoint of supporting parents yeah, and kids, which is the transformation I would like to see in our own country. <laughs> so cultural relativism is great. We want to be aware of all the cultural differences, but the United Nations has determined that children have human rights, and these yeah. human rights are guaranteed to all children. So if your horizontal <laughs> partners don't believe in the human rights aspect, it's going to be an uphill battle. Luckily, every country I've gone to, they do believe that children have human rights and they are stakeholders in their own country, their own culture, and they want to ensure the human rights of children. So that's a huge battle if they're not there yet. And this is a battle that I'm not willing to give up that it could be relative that, well, some kids don't deserve these human rights. So that's where I am unwilling to budge on my cultural values. And it's also the values of all the United Nations countries and most of the countries that I've been to as well. Yes? I guess, Lisa, where do you feel safe in terms of your current horizontal partners or kids feeling that you're going into their environment, their community, going in and out of their culture, 
their methods? Well, I mean, like from their from the research and things, they did think college could get better, but still in their methods that have been in their study, we don't think that they're worse in some of these pictures. Like so but as I mentioned, you have to be willing to say, I'm just having conversations with people and that's my goal, and it, that could be the end of the situation. So everyone who's doing the programs for child abuse prevention is asking us to come because they see pervasive violence in their culture. So they're asking us for help because we have a lot more experience in the realm of violence prevention. And so we're going to tell them what we know and they're telling us what they know and we're coming to an agreement about what do you think might work in your situation and then they're going and doing it and then I'm coming back here and maintaining that partnership years into the future. So there is no hierarchy involved. It's constant interplay with I know certain things and they know certain other things. And both of those sets of knowledge are helping to prevent child abuse in those communities. <coughs> so I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I think we do. I think it's a slow, glacially paced process. And so a lot of people in my field are traveling around the world and bringing some ideas back. And then we have to work within our culture, which is litigious, law-based, racist, white dominated. So for us to bring some of those things back, but one example is mindfulness. 25 years ago, you would never hear in university campuses that you should start meditating to deal with trauma. But Eastern ideas now have been tested with Western neuroscience, and now we know that we can use those Eastern developed ideas to help traumatize people here. It just takes decades to do that. It should be everyone's concern. It should be all of our concern, for sure. Yeah. As a woman, have you thought, have you had difficulty trying to communicate with the horizontal system and the patriarchal society? And if so, how did you overcome those? Yes, I do. Um, I'm just a very direct person. And I haven't had any like sexual harassment, but I have had dismissing attitudes. Um, and so I just do what I came there to do. You know, I'm not gonna have to live with them. But yeah, in Russia was probably the worst patriarchal experience I had where pretty much men would just roll their eyes and walk away when they invited me there, you know. Um, I don't take it personally though. Um, but yeah, there is patriarchal um, stuff going on. So the first trip that I ever took was to Northern Ireland. And you may or may not know about the troubles in Northern Ireland, but basically it's been going on for 700 years with Protestants and Catholics fighting each other. And the Catholics tend to be the lower socioeconomic status group that has more discrimination in the workplace. They have all kinds of oppression. They're being surveilled on a constant basis. They have high rates of incarceration. And so they had many areas of the troubles. And so one of the things to keep in mind is the difference between what tourists see and what people actually see when they're trying to do work in the culture. So when you're a tourist to Northern Ireland, you're seeing these gorgeous green rolling hills and these medieval castles and the seaside and you're seeing all these gorgeous beaches. And so that's usually what you're writing home about. You know, you're on your Instagram with your woohoo, I'm in a castle. Um, and then down the street, the people in Northern Ireland are living in these segregated communities. So this is very apropos with our discussion of building a wall right now. So this is called the peace line, and this is to separate Catholics from Protestants. 
and you can see it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And so the Catholics are really being surveilled. There's watchtowers everywhere, and they're trying to bring us psychologists in to think about the effects of growing up like this on the kids and trying to prevent those kids from growing up to perpetuate violence. So the kids grow up in these neighborhoods where they see lots of graffiti, they see lots of nationalism, patriotism, a lot of rhetoric of inter-ethnic battles and so forth. And so the kids are constantly getting these messages about Catholic is this, Protestant is this, you know, this is like we will never submit to the rule of the Irish. And so it, this was my first trip to try to kind of think about how does cultural violence influence violence in children and families. And so um, in 1968, there was this huge problem with the Troubles, police brutality, people were killed, and I went there around 1998, and so the graffiti was like, nothing has changed. The Catholics are still being brutalized, there's still bombings, the Irish Republican Army was bombing places, people were being incarcerated on both sides. Um, and so I was just interested in some of the testimonials of the kids who grew up in these situations um, and a lot of them talked about nationalism and that, you know, these are the people who fought for our country. A lot of them have family members who died in various conflicts and so forth. And so um, the kids' testimonies about how they had bombs thrown through their windows, they couldn't escape, their dad died, all kinds of things like this. He said, you know, the house was on fire, but we lived at the back of the peace line, so they couldn't even get out because they had grates on their windows. So it's sort of like living in the projects in the U.S. where if you have bars on the window, you really can't escape. Um, and so the other groups of kids would often talk about how they wished they could be friends with Protestants or Catholics, that they wished they knew someone from that group. You know, they wondered what they were really like. And so that's kind of the in that we have with violence prevention is people are curious about the other groups and people are really interested in figuring out how can the next generation not perpetuate um, this sort of violence. And so at the same time I was going to Northern Ireland, I heard about the American Psychological Association starting this new parenting program to prevent child abuse. So I started getting involved with this and we developed a program that's culturally relevant to every culture that it's been in. The parents love it. They've asked to come to the classes again. It builds community between a lot of different parents. Um, it's flexible, it's cheap. No one's ever gonna make a profit off of it. Every other evidence-based program that I've ever seen, someone's getting rich off of it. And so we wanted a program that no one would ever make any money off of. And so this is what the Act Raising Safe Kids program is, and this is what I go and deliver to other countries, and then they think about whether and how, if not, this might work. And so these are all the countries that the Act Raising Safe Kids program is in right now. And I've, I think I've done about seven of these countries, but we have facilitators all around the world who are from each of these cultures. And so the first Fulbright that I had, after I went to Northern Ireland, I just became really interested in this idea of a divided society. And how does a divided society with all these graffiti and rhetoric and nationalism and not knowing the other side, how do they interact with their kids? How does it relate to kids' um, abuse and neglect? So in 1974, this little island of Cyprus, the Turkish military came across the sea and just took over the northern part of the island. So for hundreds of years, the Turkish and Greek people lived together side by side, intermarried. The Turkish came in, took over, and talking about what the U.S. did, the U.S. and the British came in and they were fighting in a war for a long time. So we came in and decided that we needed to make this green line. And we felt that they should not interact with each other. So all the Greek people got sent away and moved to the south. And all of the Turkish people got sent away and moved to the north. So imagine your neighbor was a Greek family for years and now there's Turkish people you've never met living in your neighbor's house and vice versa. So a lot of people were kidnapped, murdered, missing. And so I was working, crossing the green line. You can't cross the green line, it's all armed guards. 
You can only cross through certain checkpoints with militia and you have to show your passport and all these things. So I was working across the green line every day, crossing back and forth um, and teaching at both universities and doing different training. So once again, Cyprus is this stunningly beautiful place that a lot of tourists go to to see the beaches and the castles. A lot of Europeans love to go to Cyprus. But when you think about what a lot of the symbols represent, for example, most of the Greek Orthodox churches were like medieval cathedrals, like Notre Dame, were converted into Muslim mosques and vice versa on the other part of the island. And so you're starting to see a lot of big Turkish flags painted on the mountains. Um, and if this was your street, you could have had a neighbor right there that you've known for 20 years, and now the street is blocked off and you can't have any contact with them. So now the Turkish part of the island is completely living in poverty. No countries in the world will recognize it. When I was teaching there, there's rolling blackouts every day in class. There's rabid dogs everywhere. I'm like fighting my way through rabid dogs to teach my class. And then in the South, it's part of the European Union. So they have all kinds of privileges and recognition. So what is it like for the kids to be growing up in the Turkish community that's dilapidated, there's bullet holes everywhere, there's no cell service, there's no international support, and they're not even allowed to cross into the other community. And it's just, it's a trip. Some of the villages are just empty. Like you'll go to a village where people were just evacuated and there's like a car dealership with cars from 1974 and they're brand new and they're just still there. It's like a ghost town in so many places where people were just removed. Yeah. Has there been any sense of Turkey creating fireworks or celebrating Cyprus? Turkish Cypriots, yes. Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, yes, they're constantly working on it. And the current Greek president is very interested in reconciliation. Turkey, no. Yeah, so this is in the capital. There's a bunch of bullet holes in the buildings. These are some of my Greek students. So I did a bunch of lectures and a bunch of trainings and tried to figure out, I tried to get the Greek psychologist and the Turkish psychologist to get together and do a project with me of child abuse prevention. And I actually got them to cross the green line and talk to each other and meet each other. And so they then started programming together. Um, so we probably only have about five more minutes, but I also did work in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is also, as I mentioned, war-torn recently in the 90s, lots of trauma um, and <coughs> high rates of child abuse whenever you have um, any kind of political violence. So these are the Balkans. This is our first ladies home in Slovenia. Beautiful, but there's a lot of great things to see as tourists, but in something like Dubrovnik, which is the most visited place in Eastern Europe, it's this gorgeous medieval walled city, and people don't realize that during the war, the Serbians came in boats and started shelling petrol bombs into the walled city and they had cannons up here and they just were firing into the walled city and killing everyone like trapped rats in there and all of these medieval buildings were going up in flames. So you're like on your cruise ship coming in going to visit this and you have no idea that the residents there, what they have been through and these are just a few pictures of what it was like inside there um, and these are the cannons up at the top just shooting down. And so when you go to, um, where's my sheet? When you go to Sarajevo in Bosnia, they have this map to show that for three years, the Bosnian Muslims were in here trapped in a valley in Sarajevo. And the Serbian forces were all around here just shelling daily. So people started starving to death and they were, <coughs> crawling around trying to find firewood and snipers were just everywhere killing everyone. And this went on for three years and then the U.S. decided to bomb Serbia. So what is their, what is the Serbian view of the U.S.? What is the Bosnian view of the U.S.? What is the Croatian view of the U.S.? Um, you can see that these are some of the activists on the Bosnian side. They kept some of the houses. Um, to show how fortified the houses were and the bullet holes are still there. 
This was the one that really did me in, was the children's monument of all the kids who were killed in those three years in Sarajevo. And yeah, you just walk down the street and it, there's still just war everywhere, and this was in the 90s. And then this is the quaint little place in Russia that I went to that a lot of Europeans go here for camping, for little cabins, it's really peaceful. But they have the most number of mob hits and mob kidnappings of any region in Russia. And so people are living in fear of all of these um, mobsters and corrupt politicians making reports against them and so forth. So this is right in the middle of Russia. And um, no, <laughs> the interesting part about this was nobody spoke English and they couldn't afford translators. So it was it's really important to be flexible. So I was there for three weeks doing all kinds of stuff with um, a couple of college students who volunteered to try to speak English. <laughs> so yeah, I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just show you some slides. Something to think about in, re in previous Soviet republics is that religion was banned during Soviet times. And so now that most of the previous Soviet countries are very impoverished, they're turning to religion again, faith and religion. And this is a brand new cathedral where I was, the statue of Lenin in the square. Those are all the people that came to the violence prevention training. Um, I've been going to the Middle East a lot lately, um, and it's really great because you can use all of the cultural values they have to protect children. You don't have to have foster care. You don't have to have mandated reporting. Um, there's a lot of tenets in Islam that really support the work for children's human rights. Um, and this is Sheikh Zayed Mosque. It's one of the biggest mosques in the world. Um, I got that amazing shot at sunset. <laughs> then I went to rural Tanzania. I had no idea the plane was like 11 seat safari plane and that was the airport. So I had a little bit of a panic attack, but I was down here in Tanzania. And this was the one that I really felt the most hesitant to go to because I knew that there would be no other white people anywhere. I didn't want to have any kind of inkling of colonialism. I was just like, I don't want to be, I'm probably not the right person to come and do this, but all of the program directors convinced me that they wanted me to come. They had met me before in Mexico when I was doing training. And so I went and I went on safaris and that was going back to her question, think about it. I'm going on a safari to see these amazing animals, which cost a lot of money. And then I'm going to work with families who don't have any furniture and they don't have anything to speak of and we're asking them to protect children. So this is a constant mental gymnastic that goes through your mind. So I went to a lot of home visits. I met with a lot of grandmas, a lot of moms, a lot of kids, and they were so receptive to all of the ideas that the program developers were talking about. So the agency that I work with that invited me is called Railway Children, and their goal is to keep children off the streets, and a lot of kids are running away to the streets. So that's their goal that they identified, is to keep kids from running away. How can you help us? And then they came to my trainings and we are, have worked out a plan now that they're implementing and they are doing the best of any country I've ever worked in. Um, the kids have to buy all their own uniforms, they have to pay to go to school, and the families are really, really proud when their kids can go down the street in a uniform and sit at the bus stop and they know that their kid has the status of going to school. So these are my ACT champions in Tanzania. They all are implementing this in their own villages with parents, teaching parents how to nurture, how to look at their kids, how to support their kids' schooling and development. Even if they can't read, they can still show interest in their kids' education and so forth. And so this is my horizontal team over there. So they're doing the most of any country I've ever been to. They've already done 15 groups of parents in 15 different villages. So it's just been super awe-inspiring for me. So that's my little journey around the world. We're about two minutes over, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes? Um, the act in your, in your um, program, what does that stand for? Adults and Children Together Raising Students. 